Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Making Waves with Wet podcast. In every episode, you'll get a glimpse into the latest news, insights, and the real people who are making waves in the wastewater industry. Plus, you'll hear the stories and some of the behind the scenes secrets about how wet comes together. So thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. This is Liz Bothwell from WET, and I'm with David Lloyd, CEO of FredSense Technologies. Hi, David. Welcome, and thanks for being on the show. Thank you. So excited to be here. So I'd love to hear more about your background and your journey to FredSense. Sure. Um, A bit of an eclectic one. I like to say that every good startup has a great founding story, and I think that we had a really interesting one getting into FredSense. So my background is in biochemistry and synthetic biology. Um, I went and did my undergraduate degree at the University of Alberta up here in Canada, uh, and then pursued a master's degree more focused on cancer biology and biochemistry at the University of Calgary. And through my undergraduate experiences, um, I was very fortunate to have stumbled into a rather eclectic professor, uh, as there are many at the University of Alberta, that was recruiting for something called the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition. Believe it or not, it's a large international uh, competition where undergraduate teams uh, from universities around the world uh, gathered to, at the time, MIT in Boston, to develop some kind of genetic-based or biologically-based solution to a problem and then go and present that work. So it was sort of a science Olympics, if you will, for uh, genetic engineers and, and biochemists. And I just fell in love with this idea of how we could use biology and the world around us as an engineerable tool to solve challenges um, that uh, we, we've created and, and producing new types of value and impact uh, with the technology that just fit so well to what I was doing. Uh, And I ended up getting involved in this competition quite heavily, ended up leading teams um, of of students as I continued through my graduate career, uh, and very fortunately ran into some fantastic people in the Calgary community that uh, were co-competitors with me on a team. And we started up a project that surrounded the use of microorganisms as sensors Uh, to monitor different types of contaminants that could be found at the time in the oil and gas industry, but really across any type of environmental application. Uh, We took it to the competition, did quite well. We were one of the top 16 teams out of several hundred, uh, beating out some major uh, universities from around the world um, and doing quite well. And on the heels of this, myself and Uh, some of the other leaders of the team sat down and said, you know, this really has potential. And um, what do we all think about trying to spin this out of the university and turning it into a startup? And that's how FredSense was born. So a little bit of uh, an odd route to uh, development coming through this more academic competition-based system through, uh, through our work. And now FredSense is positioned in a great way to be able to help bring these biosensors uh, to, to life and to, uh, to the market so that we can help support various applications, not just in oil and gas, but in drinking water, groundwater monitoring, um, and all of the uh, environmental applications that really needs faster ways of understanding what's in their water today. Oh, absolutely. What an interesting origin story. I love that it had that those academic roots to it. That's awesome. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. And it was such a great, I'll always be so thankful for the competition because uh, in academia, you get this fantastic opportunity to really learn the rigor of uh, science and how to do research. Um, but for many uh, universities, it can be difficult to get that industrial research experience. And I feel like this gave 
us this eye-opening experience of how do you do development on a budget that's mission-driven, that's focused on solving problems um, for people um, and doing it in a responsible and human-first way. Um, and I, I think unbeknownst to us, we were really thinking with a startup mindset before we even engaged into a, uh, a forming a, a company or an organization. That's fantastic. And it seems you are answering the question about what's what's in your water, what's in our water. What do you what do you think we all need to know about what's in our water? Yeah, I, I, it's such a I think important question that touches every person, uh, independent of what you're doing, uh, the materials that you use in the world, the way we go about our days. We interact with water all the time. And oftentimes what may look clean and clear uh, and drinkable or like there's nothing in it uh, could have different types of chemicals, have different types of contaminants, biological materials found inside of it. So understanding what's in your water, I think is a highly underrated and important topic um, that isn't just reserved for the water utilities, but really to everyone uh, because it's so important to our lives and what we do. Um, and I think it's important for us to know what, uh, what's in our water and what that data means. So at FredSense, what we focus on is building tools to help manage a gap in the water quality problem. And that gap specifically is for many utilities or organizations that are asking these same questions that are responsible for keeping our water clean and safe. Um, Oftentimes, there's trade-offs that have to be made on how you can get that information. There are labs that you can use to go and get that um, get that information, which could take weeks of time to get. Uh, or there are kits and different types of field-based equipment that might not be as accurate as we need them to be, uh, but are simpler and easier. So there's always this trade-off of how accurate do I want my information to be, but how quickly can I get it? And at FredSense, we're bridging that gap by using biology as the tool to do it, to create these portable kits that give you lab level accuracy, but in a time frame that operators and environmental professionals and water quality professionals need to make quick decisions. And what that decision allows them to do is they can respond to changes in their system. So if you have a drinking water, uh, uh, process. This allows you to be able to quickly make changes so you can um, adjust the whole treatment system to keep your water safe and secure. Uh, if you're going and trying to understand what the uh, impact is to an environmental site, maybe a contaminated site, or just to understand what's going on in a stormwater storm watershed, this is a way of going out and sampling and quickly getting that information. Uh, and ultimately, that affects all of us because keeping our ecosystem safe, keeping our drinking water supply safe is something that we need to be able to understand quickly and respond to when we see changes. Um, nothing, uh, you know, I think there's so many more uh, examples of where that's become relevant. Um, we've seen that across North America with uh, utilities and communities that are struggling to keep the, uh, their water quality in check and clean. Uh, and having tools to help support that um, really gives everyone the uh, data needed to be able to make decisions on what do we do about these problems. Absolutely. And I know finding COVID in wastewater has been a, a big story, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? How, how these cases were first found and what was done with the information after? Yeah, absolutely. So COVID was a really interesting opportunity for us. So FredSense, before uh, the pandemic was focused on um, uh, measuring things like arsenic or other types of contaminants that were found in drinking water and using this biological approach. And then when we entered into um, the pandemic and, and saw the massive impact, that undeniable impact that we were all experiencing um, from the changes that were going on, um, it, it forced us to sit down and really ask ourselves, well, how can we contribute and what can we do towards this kind of problem? And being a company that focused on biological systems, we were really in an interesting position to help create value there. Um, 
because we're we're used to dealing with organisms and measuring the kinds of things that they were producing. So we were focused on developing more the field instrumentation side of what was going on for the pandemic. How could we help bridge some of that gap in terms of uh, providing uh, data and understanding of what's going on within a sewer shed um, to public health decision makers, to companies, to those that needed that information right away. And that was a quite an evolving uh, a set of technologies and problems to um, really combat through the whole pandemic. So um, every agency and group and part of the world had a very different approach to how they were going after the problem. And when we started, um, the idea of being able to track COVID and wastewater uh, was a very nascent and sort of, of new idea. The idea of, of understanding what's in wastewater and, and using that as a tool wasn't new, but how we could apply that to COVID was sort of this open-ended question. And there were a lot of investigations and work that started up within even the first few months of the pandemic to really start showing that not only could you find COVID in wastewater, but understanding how much uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, how much of the virus was in that sample, held some great information to help predict what was going to happen with case numbers in up to a couple of weeks from when you took the sample. So, for example, if you saw that there was more of the virus within a wastewater sample at maybe a wastewater treatment plant, uh, or that the amount was trending up over a few days, uh, that would help you predict that there would be increased case numbers. So we started to see this uh, really vast adoption of wastewater technologies in the market to help support providing a new piece of information um, uh, to public health decision makers and to communities to know how should they respond, what's going on, especially with this waves and of 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 virus and that that were that were hitting communities. And what ended up happening was that we became more and more reliant on this kind of information, particularly when we saw variants like the Omicron variant, where uh, it, here in Canada, it became really difficult to be able to um, continue to test the, the population and uh, be able to monitor just from uh, testing individual cases. Um, and moving to wastewater analysis was a great way of understanding what was going on in the community where it was no longer possible to just look at small pockets of, of the community. So our technology, um, which has been piloted in different parts of the world, um, was a system that was basically allowing the uh, labs and the different uh, organizations that were doing analysis of the wastewater treatment plants to be able to ask questions of, well, what's going on in the sewer shed itself? So if we went to individual communities in the sewer, how could we collect more data to give more resolution on what was going on? So could we go and better understand, well, are there parts of a city or a community that are particularly um, uh, vulnerable to uh, some of the impacts of the virus? or where resources can be deployed more effectively to help um, help communities that might be at risk. So, you know, we were really happy to be playing a role in um, what was a, a very quickly evolving situation and uh, really helped generate an impact um, with a new type of data that I hope we can continue to use for so many different applications. Um, you know, we've heard about new types of viruses, um, you know, hopefully not as much SARS-CoV-2, but I, I think we live in a, a reality where we we can continue to know that we're going to see that in, in our wastewater systems, but using this as a way to better understand um, what, uh, what public health risks there are and how we can respond to them. Definitely. And I mean, you're, you're mentioning kind of what's down the road, but do you see this sort of as a predictive a helper in future pandemics and other things? Absolutely. Uh, and one of the advantages, and I think where we are now, everyone's asking the questions of what did we learn through 
these last few years, what were the things that worked in what context and what can we improve on um, if this were to ever be a new reality. And one of those really key factors is understanding what's in our wastewater sewer sheds uh, is absolutely a predictive indicator of what may um, be on the horizon. And so using these types of tools really gives us forewarning, it gives us knowledge, it gives us an ability to respond and predict what um, may be the challenges that we're going to face in the future. Whether that's uh, another uh, variant of something that we've seen today or another threat that we could see to human health. Um, so we can respond faster and be uh, more mobile and, and ready for whatever may come. Very interesting. And then how about um, emerging contaminants, uh, David? Can can you test for those and what kinds? Yeah, so the central value that we have here at RedSense is that really our, at our core, we're a platform technology where we focus on training organisms to detect different types of things. And then having those organisms very accurately and specifically respond to them. So the kinds of sensors that we've looked at in the past are things like uh, arsenic, we've looked at lead, hexavalent chromium, um, we've looked at different types of organic molecules that can be found in water, things like hydrocarbons or VTEX compounds, which might be from oil or other types of sources. Uh, and we're very interested in how we can apply the technology to a number of emerging contaminants as well. Um, things like uh, steroids, hormones, particularly those compounds that I'm, I'm sure you could imagine because they are compounds that affect our biology so much or animals biology. They're, they're compounds that are particularly good for us to be able to build sensors around because we're using those biological systems as, as a way of generating our signals. So that's something that we're very interested in seeing how we can support with, um, not just those that are more biologically based, but also those that are more synthetic. You know, a big question that we're asking ourselves right now is how we can support with PFAS um, and other types of uh, more synthetic chemicals that we're finding within our groundwater, within our environmental water system, um, but pose risk to our communities, what would it mean to have a field kit system that could easily and accurately detect these types of very, very trace compounds that are found in our environment? So the versatility of the platform is really the key to what we, we have here at FredSense, and we're really excited to be able to implement that in a variety of different applications. And emerging contaminants is one that you're going to be seeing more and more from us in the next bit. Oh, I bet. That's huge. PFAS is huge. And, you know, last I checked, it was very hard for utilities and uh, local authorities to really test for it, right? There wasn't exactly a test. So if your kit could help, that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. PFAS, I think, is a remarkable problem that we are going to only be talking more about, not less. Um, it poses a risk at every level. Um, and I think that we see that from every stakeholder, from the regulator to the utility, uh, to the industrial, asking the same question of how do we understand where it is and what do we do about it? And right now there really is no or at least to my knowledge, no field-based tool that would allow you to understand PFAS. And that's a huge limitation because if we're looking at how we can effectively treat it, whether that's by um, filtering it out of a water system or eventually destroying it as well, even on site, understanding how effective those processes are is going to be a huge part of not just understanding what's going into the system, but also to make these processes efficient um, so that these are reasonable costs to your utility. They're a reasonable opportunity to be adopted so that um, uh, communities can know that not only are they effectively removing this contaminant, but they're doing it in a way that, that is cost effective for 
uh, all of their community members um, to, to be able to adopt these great technologies that we're seeing on the remediative side. Okay, that makes sense. And, you know, speaking, I know you said it's biological and you're getting into the synthetic side of things. Does that also mean microplastics, David, or is that something kind of in the future for you guys? That's a bit farther uh, in the future for us. Uh, we are very interested in seeing what we could do on microplastics um, and how we could support with that kind of thing. And I, I think one thing that's fun to think about is how we can use biology to solve that problem more on the remediative side. How can we gobble up these plastic materials? And there's some fantastic work from various groups that are looking at how can you create organisms and enzymes using uh, different types of biological engineering to break plastics down um, and to help support with these micropollutants and um, plastic materials that just don't want to go away. So um, we're, we're just seeing so many different technologies right now that are playing in that space. We are primarily in the water quality chemicals space, um, primarily because that's how the system has been engineered to be able to uh, create the signals that we do to get it very, very accurate. And I think we're going to see more and more biological systems that will want to play a role in that will help us with the microplastics problem, um, particularly in how we can either filter them out or break them down in water systems. Very interesting. Oh my gosh, I'm sure you could see so many ways to scale, right? It's <laughs> with water quality and, and all of the issues that we're dealing with today. Oh, it's so true. There's, um, it's it's a bit unfortunate that there are as many problems as they, there are. There's a lot of opportunity in the water quality space, and we're really excited to be solving those problems. Um, and a, a really key thing for us is to understand the the ones where we can really make the highest impact. And particularly for us, we focus, because of the, the format of our technology and it being a field kit system, we oftentimes are going to small or medium-sized utility systems to help support their operations. And that's been, uh, we work with large utilities as well, but we've also been able to find ways to work with the smaller systems, which is, uh, you know, I think really important and generates um, a huge amount of impact because these are important tools that we want to make accessible to everyone uh, so that they can um, use them to help empower their movement forward. So <laughs> plenty of opportunity. And I wish we had the resources to go and just build every sensor for every contaminant that we could. Um, but we'll we'll be seeing more and more as we grow uh, to, to some really, uh, uh, I think, big and impactful opportunities that will be helping communities uh, across North America and uh, uh, much farther than that. Oh, that's great. And how is it working with the utilities? Are you finding that it's a, it's a strong partnership for you? Yeah, so utilities have been so critical to our development and these partnerships and opportunities to, especially at the beginning for us, co-develop and pilot and demonstrate the work that we're doing um, at an end user site is just so important because for us, that's really the test of how are we creating value and what are we producing uh, that's meaningful um, to someone who needs to operate a water treatment plant and, and is responsible at the end of the day for its uh, operations and impact into the community. So it's been such amazing learning and they have been uh, just phenomenal. I have to say all of our partners that we've worked with uh, in Arizona, California, uh, many of the Southwest states, uh, because we do a lot of arsenic work um, and that's where it's a little bit more prominent, uh, certainly in other parts of, of the US, uh, absolutely. But, you know, we've seen quite a bit in that space. Um, really being champions and leaders and looking at adopting new technology. And I think one of the challenges, of course, being in, in public utility infrastructure is it's it's a sometimes about being in a race to be second when it comes to innovation. Uh, you know, there's always a bit of trepidation about trying a new technology or trying a new process um, because there's such a responsibility on the water system. And so seeing 
the, the leadership of utilities to say, we understand how this will help us. We're, we're going to create a mechanism to be able to show that it will help support. Um, that's been a really productive and, and powerful way for us to work together. Oh, I bet. And I'd love to know more about your leadership transition. Was it hard to go from scientist to CEO? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was certainly a, a shift. I'll, I'll say that. So I am, just to tell you a little bit about me, I am your quintessential sciencey nerdy guy. I was never the uh, person that was selling um, lemonade on the street or anything like that. Um, it was very much more of the person asking questions about what could the world look like um, as we develop new technologies and systems and inspired by things like sci-fi and everything. So, you know, that was very much the mindset that I came into from an academic setting, um, very focused on solutioning and what the technology was able to do. And what I think became so apparent to me through the transition into the startup world was to have that mind frame shift of moving away from the tool you use to the value you create for someone. And I'm very thankful for uh, a lot of the opportunities we had early on in our growth and development. We had the opportunity to go to some fantastic accelerators, um, be part of great organizations like Imagine H2O uh, and others, which is a really prominent startup innovation water accelerator. Um, really focused on that shift of how do you find the value in what you're doing and make sure you're always putting that forward. And that was, I think, a really key part of my growth and development, uh, particularly because um, a platform technology like ours is very much uh, akin to a hammer looking for a nail. It's very much a, you, we could use it in so many different kinds of applications, which ones are best, which ones are going to create the most value for people, which one's going to allow us the most op opportunity to be able to accelerate what we wanna do in our mission. Um, and so that was a, a really important part. And I think just being open to those new experiences, to that growth uh, really helps support me uh, from a leadership potential. And as we started to grow, bringing around great people on the team um, was a huge asset to help us um, get to where we wanted to go. So um, the transition certainly um, was not overnight, but I, I do really encourage anyone that's in the scientific space or the technical space, you know, uh, the, the great thing is you understand the science. If you can understand the science, it gives you so much depth to the to the solution. Uh, have that same if you have that same passion for the people that you service and the problems that you want to solve, I think that really helps support that transition into um, the innovation ecosystem. I love that, and you're so right to make that um, because it's you know you joked about being a nerd. It's but what what the science background does is you really focus on solutions and you're really focused on processes. And if you can do that, like you said, and you build um, a great team, wow, you're on the right track for sure. That's awesome. Yeah, it, just very passionate about, I, I think there's so much value in, in bridging that gap and uh, just really strongly encourage anyone uh, who'd be interested to, you know, give it a go. I think it's so easy to, uh, to, to think of yourself in a silo, especially if you might come from an, uh, an academic space or you, you know, the same is true on the business side, if you're, you know, in sales or marketing, but bridging that gap and going and, and playing a bit on the other side of the fence, whether it's technology or business, it just rounds you out so much. Um, and I think gives you such great, incredible context. Uh, to help support wherever you're going. So just really encourage everyone to to try that. And I and I love how you really are helping students and entrepreneurs in other work. Does that give you a lot of satisfaction? Oh, so much so. So I I was very fortunate 
outside of Redsense to have been involved with a lot of fantastic science education organizations. I have a huge passion for helping students and young people really have the opportunity to get involved in things that um, I, I have in Alberta. I was part of an organization for a while that um, helps set up labs at high schools um, to be able to do genetic engineering, to do synthetic biology work, to have um, high school students uh, engage in this, um, this type of technology and show, hey, this is something you can do. We'd oftentimes go to rural locations and uh, show them that they can actually make these kinds of things happen. And some of these um, teams even ended up going and competing at the iGEM competition like, like I did and, and winning some pretty big awards. Uh, and it was just amazing to see the shift for a lot of students who um, would start off saying, well, I'm gonna go, I'm not gonna go to university, you know, because of some kind of um, maybe in their mind, um, wall or or issue in in order to be able to do that, and just giving these kids a bit of um, confidence to say, hey, this is something that's, yeah, you know, you're smart, you know how to do this, it, you have the ability to engage in it. Just seeing the shift to, you know, maybe I will go to university, or maybe I'll engage in science in something in a different way where it's not so scary. It, it was really, really been one of the most rewarding things um, from the education side and. Um, have had the opportunity now to uh, sit on on some boards, and um, one of those is a, a high school science uh, 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 publication uh, where uh, high school students can submit their papers and work that they're doing in the science space to it and get them peer reviewed um, before even getting into university. And it's a huge opportunity for a, a lot of these students to be able to engage in something that uh, maybe feels outside of the norm for them or can give them an opportunity to um, help with their resume, to learn something new, to figure out what they want to do uh, as they're going through their academic journey or career. Um, so it's it's really been rewarding. I, I love being in the science education space. Oh, I bet. And what a great opportunity for these students and young entrepreneurs. That's amazing work. Yeah, and I think we we need to engage people in this throughout their journey, um, whether that be at high school or through undergraduate ex experience or afterwards, is that um, there are so many fantastic and amazing technologies that are emerging. There's so much opportunity that we're seeing in industries. And I, it's all just a continuum of how do we help engage people in uh, the innovation ecosystem. How do we help uh, bring new solutions, whether you exist in a large organization or a small organization, you run one or you're an employee or maybe even a volunteer to a not-for-profit. How, how can we help bridge that gap to how technologies and solutions that are getting developed um, can be applied to the work that you're doing? And I think um, having these kinds of mindsets and skills and uh, ways to engage each other is just um, going to be more and more important as we start to uh, think about solving the challenges that are coming up for us, which are some some big ones, <laughs> independent of what space we're in. Uh, and I, I think it's that shift that um, empowering people towards is going to uh, create so much opportunity for us all. Oh, definitely. So tell me, what's next for you and Fred Sense? Yeah, so we are incredibly excited um, at Fred Sense to be continuing a lot of the water quality work that we're doing um, on the arsenic side. We are doing more DNA and RNA analysis for all sorts of things in wastewater and moving outside of wastewater. Um, and we're going to be launching a couple of new sensors in 2023 working in more of the mining space and then also in more of the environmental monitoring space. Uh, so uh, we're going to be looking at selenium a bit more, which is really around how can we help power plants or the coal, coal industry that is under very, very strict regulatory requirement that 
is is um, under a lot of scrutiny right now. How can we help ensure that emissions are clean and that um, our ecosystem is staying safe in a lot of these um, more heavy industries? Uh, and then also on the emerging contaminant side, you're going to be hearing a lot uh, from us on how we'll be working to support on the field monitoring side there. So we're, we're very excited to um, be continuing to make an impact in that space. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, before I let you go, is there anything else you want to share that I didn't ask you about? Uh, Jess, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here in the conversation and uh, the chance to uh, engage with your listeners um, and uh, that water quality is important. And I hope everyone uh, thinks a little bit more about what's maybe coming out of that tap or what they're using every day and how important it is to our lives and to everything around us. Oh, definitely. And I will certainly be thinking more about it. Thanks to you, David. So thanks again. No problem. Have a great day. Okay. You too.